Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TreeSearch Research Infrastructure Webinars uh, organized by TreeSearch and um, 4MAX and also Chalmers University of Technology. And today, uh, Christine and me, we have a great pleasure to welcome Roland Kadar from Chalmers. And Roland will uh, give you a presentation about the new exciting experiments that he and his team performed at the 4MAX beam line and where the rheological studies were combined with uh, SACS and COSAX. Please, Roland, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much for the very nice introduction and for the invitation. Um, you know that rule where uh, we, we say, uh, tell our students, uh, you are supposed to present to uh, your work only when you're about ready to uh, have it published. Well, I'm breaking this rule a second consecutive time. If you've been to the 34th uh, user meeting, uh, Max for user meeting, uh, you should know it's the same talk. So I, it's my second consecutive time I break this rule um, uh, with the, the, the pleasure of at least sharing with the community what, uh, what uh, we've been doing. So hello everyone, my name is Roland. I'm associate professor here at Chalmers. Um, and if I were to summarize this entire presentation into one word, that would be collaboration. And I have to highlight here, uh, we made contact in 2017 with the idea of uh, building something special at uh, Max4 regarding rheology. And it was Ann Terry, Tim Nigord, Marianne Libby, Alexander Martich, and myself. We are a project that has survived the pandemic. We are affected by the pandemic. Uh, our experiments came a little bit late, but we have survived it. And I'm happy to say that throughout the pandemic, we still managed to hire Reza, our postdoc who worked uh, on, on the project. So this talk is about combining rheology. I myself find myself here in rheology um, and, and SACS. I don't find myself in SACS, but you see, I have very, very good team support um, uh, at COSAX and Formax being lines headed by Ann Terry and Kim Ligord, uh, respectively. <laughs> Uh, to give you a sort of overview, I will be trying to focus, uh, I, I don't know my audience, I see just numbers, but uh, I will be going through something very general about rheology and I will use it as a segue to into what we have at Max4, so general information for users. And then I will try to go into some uh, uh, niche experiments. Basically, our goal from the very beginning was to deliver some niche experiments, some, something new that we would do at Max4 and that hasn't been done. I have to say that's not very easy. There are fantastic experiments out there. Uh, but we have managed, uh, we have three surprises um, uh, in, in store for the community. And I'm gonna talk about one of them because it's enough that I break <laughs> uh, my rule second, uh, just uh, second time, but uh, there's more preliminary data. Like I said, the pandemic pushed us a little bit late. But uh, the new surprises, let's say, will come out from uh, Rheology and uh, SACS at, at Max4 uh, soon enough. So without uh, uh, any further ado, Rheology, what does it stand for? Just briefly, we're all very much uh, learned from very early on to distinguish between uh, pure viscous fluids or, or liquids and, and uh, solids, right? This is something also intuitive and something that we were taught in school from from very young age. Uh, the good news for for those uh, who are, call themselves rheologists is that uh, most of the materials out there, so very few uh, uh, materials are actually pure liquids. Very few materials in certain conditions are pure pure solids or purely elastic solids. Most of the materials out there are neither. Uh, rather, they disclose characteristics of both depending on the observation time scale, depending on how how we uh, uh, of our, on, on, uh, on our experiment, let's say. So here, if I start with the blood, and I always make this joke because uh, uh, I was asked the first time I, I presented this graph, by the way, this is a teaching graph. Uh, why did you start with blood? And the truth was that it was one of the first examples that I, I learned about in school, but the sec uh, an additional answer could have been, well, I'm originally from a part of the world called Transylvania. So maybe that comes uh, comes with it. And being Zoom, I imagine you're laughing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so study from blood, uh, all of the food that maybe you're enjoying secretly now, because uh, that's the advantage of Zoom. We don't have to, to uh, uh, we, we can enjoy other things as well at the same time. Uh, toothpaste, I uh, added here a lot uh, of uh, wood-based uh, materials uh, to, to, since cellulose is very important for, for Sweden. Paints, uh, adhesives, uh, tires, uh, bone, uh, solid plastics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
all of these are this topic of rheology. So if you have any of these materials, which means more, uh, most of uh, your, it's very likely because it's most materials out there, it is probably uh, uh, adequate that you would try to investigate their structure to probe their structure using at some point rheology. And if you're interested in the, let's say, nanoscale interactions or structures, then you might go to synchrotron or neutron scattering experiments. Uh, you know what? What else is the? By the way, we call all, all of these. Uh, you will hear them as non-Newtonian, uh, viscoelastic, uh, complex fluids, etc. You know what else is uh, non-Newtonian? Lava. And I'm telling you this just because this is. Uh, uh, I have a lot of notations here on the screen, but you see, maybe you distinguish here. This is the new volcano in Iceland, uh, uh, um, and uh, this is what we got to see while participating to the Nordic Energy Conference. The message here is very important things happen, uh, very special things happen at the Nordic Energy Conference, and I'll come back to that in the end. Uh, and we got to experience this uh, live. Uh, little did we know that lava is actually non Newtonian. You can ask me in the questions uh, why. All right, so let's say in terms of broadness of materials, you could say it, it's, it's quite a significant part, even if it's a small niche technique. Now, I want to unravel everything we're doing here, and if you, if you, uh, basically, I will show you uh, in this slide, you have the essence of what we're doing. And if we, uh, if somebody grasps this, you basically grasp everything. But you will see that even these simple things have uh, can have uh, big surprises. So essentially, in rheology, we have the material, and we're trying to subject it to a certain uh, defined motion. We read a material response in this form of stress. And uh, based on a constant relation, uh, we, we try to relate uh, these two. And of course, for us, material means structure, uh, which is what we're trying to probe. And we always try to go to very simple motions. And you may be familiar from, from early on in school, simple shear flow, where we, uh, let's say, if you have uh, two parallel plates, uh, you rotate one or move one of them and keep the other one fixed. Uh, and based on this, you can compute, for example, the most widely used rheological uh, quantity viscosity. So if you, if I would summarize everything we're doing on the stacks for most uh, purposes is, is simple shear in different forms, but as you will see, simple shear can also lead to uh, some uh, interesting, uh, more peculiar phenomenon, if, if, you, if you like. So bottom line right now is that we have commissioned such a device that uses simple shear to measure rheological properties at uh, the COSAC line at max four. And you have here an enormous amount of equipment left and right. And here in the middle is, is a rotation rheometer. It's a Anton Bar uh, MCR 702 multi drive. Um, and it looks as complicated, it is as complicated as it looks, but it's also uh, uh, very much fun to try, especially, especially the experiments. So if you're a general user, what will you find if you join, try to uh, join Max4 for a rheology experiment on the, on the synchrotron? Um, uh, uh, most, uh, the most widely used geometry uh, is, is uh, uh, concentric cylinder geometry on, on synchrotrons. Um, um, and uh, if you have that in mind, uh, you would need about 20 milliliters of, of a substance for that. Um, it, there are also some limitations, of course. This is valid for, let's say, dilute solutions and concentrated solutions. If you have something like melts, then the torques are too high. And there are other options, which from a, a, a synchrotron point of view are not maybe the best outcome, but sometimes you don't have any other choice. Either you have too little sample or you have to, to, to viscous of a sample. Um, and in a parallel plate and cone plate geometry, you need just about uh, 0.5 milliliters or even less in a, in a cone plate. Uh, and uh, uh, we have different, uh, different, I will come back to this actually. Uh, uh, but the, the, an important thing here is to say, don't look at this and think this is it. Uh, we are coupling our labs together. So uh, uh, basically, if you, if you want to do something and you can't find it here, for us, it means excellent. We are especially interested in experiments that have unique, require unique, uh, unique solutions to be able to perform them. So um, uh, despite what I show here as, as what you'll find by default is a standard equipment, I just talked to Ann Terry, Kim Nigor, and myself, uh, and we, if you have something special that you want to do, and we'll try to, to uh, basically fix it. Um, and you have to imagine the environmental chamber. So uh, all these geometries sit in this uh, convection oven, 
uh, this picture right over here. Uh, and we can currently perform experiments between room and uh, 200 degrees. Yes, that's you know, minus that's 200 degrees. Uh, but again, for example, this would be an example where, where we can also couple it to, uh, with liquid nitrogen, but uh, then uh, you just have to talk to us and we can, we can make it happen. Uh, by default, uh, standard air, uh, but also inner gas experiments are possible. Um, and we have, of course, geometry duplicates for offline and inline tests. So if you arrive at Mox Max for a little bit early, you could even perform uh, some offline tests uh, and see how your system is behaving before you go to the beamline, which is standard practice again for for uh, for this type of systems. Uh, you have to ignore this. Uh, this would be a glass chamber um, um, uh, environmental uh, uh, environmental chamber for uh, offline tests, and this would be what you would find for inline tests. You see these uh, captain uh, window and sets through which the beam would go. This this black thing I, I deleted here. That's the surprise that probably will come maybe towards the end of uh, next year. All right, and this is uh, um, uh, partly uh, like I said, I'm the realty part of this. So this is for me to remember uh, uh, what am I supposed to say uh, on the results, uh, but nevertheless, it could be useful. As how that would a standard uh, SACS, uh, uh, real SACS test and data analysis look like? So as I said, usually the most common uh, setup you would have, that would be this concentric cylinder setup. And you would have typically two types of incident beams. You may wanna have uh, an incident beam that goes uh, radially, um, uh, right through the, the, the middle of the concentric cylinders. And uh, one uh, 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 letter B here that goes tangentially, and they both end up on a 2D detector. And let's assume your sample is isotropic. There's no an isotropy in, in your system. This is synthetic data. It really looks this good. Uh, and notice that you have here different, different uh, numbers, and that corresponds to whether you are shooting through the in what plane you're shooting, you have the velocity direction, you have the velocity gradient direction, and the vorticity direction. This can, this is very important to to to, uh, to sort of know how to set up your experiment to try to gain the insight that you want to uh, to 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 uh, to, uh, to get. Uh, out of these diffraction patterns, this would be our raw data. We could do radial integration. So essentially, we're looking at how this signal varies uh, with the radius. Uh, as you see here, we have an intensity as function of the Q vector. And we could also do azimuthal integration, which means, let me change colors, green now, azimuthal integrations, which means, let's say, we integrate on uh, azimuthally this, this signal. And of course, if you have complete the anisotropy, uh, isotropy, then you would get a straight line. And what happens if you don't have uh, an isotropic uh, system? Um, uh, so this was the you know, isotropic uh, ring example. It would be a, where we have, would have strong an isotropy. And uh, you notice here immediately, if we are looking at the velocity, uh, uh, velocity vorticity plane, or in the uh, velocity gradient vorticity plane, we see that we have uh, a different uh, 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 basically angle here from azimuthal integration we see that these peaks basically have moved to, to, to other uh, angles. Uh, and I will explain to you a little bit later what this means in, in, in terms of, of, of structure. All right, uh, but I was mentioning some niche experiments and uh, uh, I have to say, this is a course, this is a slide that I take from a PhD course. So if you've taken that, you will know this very, very well. Uh, we're actually going outside in this example. Uh, we're going to go outside the limits of rheometry. And you might find this also in uh, several books. Uh, you know, it's the, we define the Newtonian viscosity here from the simple shear. And we have a flow curve. And you might see something like this. If you plot the viscosity as function of shear rate, let's take this as a Newtonian fluid. It's the easiest. You will find here a straight line. and either in writing or in this case it's it's uh, right uh, outright labeled here we have two limits we learned that in the uh, in the lower shear rate limit it's typically instrumentation sensitivity but we're mostly interested in in the upper limit here where it says either too high torques or you get flow instabilities hmm. what uh, what uh, do we mean by that and to, to so we're going to focus on actually this 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 range here trying to to go outside of conventional rheometry 
And this takes us back to the origins of this commentary. This is Mr. Maurice Coet uh, and his PhD thesis in 1890. He was dealing with a big question. How do we obtain the shear viscosity? Because the equations of Navier's and Stokes have been, had been outlined, but getting this coefficient of viscosity was pretty damn difficult. And of course, uh, he didn't, wasn't doing synchrotron experiments, but uh, Maurice Coet had a, uh, a, quite, a, quite a figure here if you, if you read about him. Uh, he had a, a concentric cylinder system, and here I have to exemplify it. I hadn't prepared this, but it's a cup and a bob, and you put them in like this, and you rotate one of them or the other one. You, know, you have two options here. And Mr. Maurice Coet, he was rotating the outer one. Um, now, at about the same time, um, Arnold H.R. Malloch, so Coet, by the way, everybody knows him, it's the Coet flow. Uh, Malloch didn't make it uh, to contemporary parlance, but uh, he was, uh, by all accounts, a very, very gifted uh, experimentalist, and he designed his experiments very, very nicely. He had designed, actually, uh, 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 viscometers, uh, both with the outer cylinder rotating or the inner cylinder rotating. No, I'm really happy to be in my office, otherwise I wouldn't have these props around here. Uh, when, I, when, I was, when I gave this talk at Max 4, then I had to um, take some coffee uh, cups and that didn't work too well. Um, and it's, uh, there were several problems with Malloch's experiment, but one of them was actually this, this idea of, of rotating the inner cylinder, which didn't, which didn't seem to give any, any results. Um, so why did Coet and uh, get a shear viscosity? Uh, and why Mr. Malloch did not uh, was elucidated around 1920 something, uh, 1922, if I remember correctly, by Geoffrey Ingram Taylor, Sir Geoffrey Ingram Taylor, uh, who demonstrated by injecting in the system a little bit of dye, so ink, demonstrated that there was some, uh, some strange phenomenon going on there, meaning there were vortices that were forming. So it changed the torque and you couldn't get actually the, the vis shear viscosity. Uh, and what did he observe? So here is a, a, a typical geometry you see here in black is the inner cylinder. And in our case, the outer cylinder is transparent, something that you will not find on a normal measuring device. We do that so that we can visualize the flow and see what is happening. And in this simple case, we have Newtonian fluid with visualization powder. And here we rotate the inner cylinder. We have here omega is rotating. And the, here we rotate the outer cylinder. So if you want, this is the coet. Uh, the uh, viscometer, and this is the Malloch uh, version. And as soon as they start spinning, uh, the Reynolds number also, by the way, increases for those of you who uh, like to follow that one. Um, and the, the purpose of these visualization powders that we add is simply to be able to see. So now it's, it's simple uh, laminar, simple shear flow, uh, almost. There's some caveats there, but simple shear flow, like I presented in rheometry, and still. At the critical rotation rate, the simple shear flow, as you can see here, can deliver the secondary flows in the form of, of vortices. Uh, in opposite to Mr. Uh, Coet's uh, device, whom did not disclose that, it's stable over, over all Reynolds numbers. Uh, and he could get a linear relationship between torque and, and, uh, and uh, shear rate. Uh, what are we, oh, by the way, these visualization powders are what you see also in shampoo commercials. It's a very old slide. Um, what do we have here? It's a very interesting system. So in our laminar system, what we use to, laminar flow that we use to, to compute viscosity, a material particle, and I talk here as a continuum mechanicist, a material particle, an infinitesimal uh, uh, part of the flow that has the same properties as the, the, uh, uh, the fluid itself. This moves in a circular trajectory and uh, beyond the critical, uh, 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 let's say, Reynolds number rotation rate, it starts to actually uh, move in a, in a helicoidal trajectory. So you have these, these vortices forming. Fascinating, right? Um, because these vortices can change depending on what input parameters you do get. So in this impossible to follow, this is from my PhD thesis uh, summary of a very famous paper by Andre Liu and uh, Sweeney. Uh, impossible to follow diagram, but we can see something. If this is the rotation of the inner cylinder, the vertical axis, and we have here the rotation of the outer cylinder, all of these letters are different states in which this flow uh, can self-assemble, can assemble, uh, different types of vortices. 
Um, and for us rheologists, since the 80s, 90s, it was a very popular term to add actually a vertical. So this goes out of plane. And this is an axis where we can put here, instead of a Reynolds number, we can put what is called an elasticity number, which means we go non-Newtonian. And there you might see other letters here, a combination of letters, uh, uh, also uh, an alteration of the stability. When do these vortices appear? And these have consequences for viscometry, I have to say, even if now we want to study them on, uh, them on their own. In viscometry, essentially, you will get these as well sometimes, and that would be the limit of your uh, measurement, but they can also be misinterpreted, for example, for infinite shear viscosity. So it's quite important to know, know about these things. All right. Um, now, what was our in, uh, sort of entry into this is related also to materials. So we want to design, again, a unique experiment. And uh, to do that, I want you to introduce you to cellulose nanocrystals. Yes, uh, about uh, rod line nano, uh, rod line, rod like nanoparticles, as you can see in this very nice uh, AFM uh, image. And the remarkable property in water in certain conditions is that they kind of feel their neighbors and they form what are called uh, carnomatic and or nematic crystals in, in, in this at uh, certain concentrations. Uh, and what you see here as in green would be uh, an isotropic phase that is non-self-assembled and what you have here in blue are self-assembled parts. And without many details about this, uh, everything we're going to talk from now on is, enters the biphasic uh, case. Uh, a consequence of this is that it can be observed as macroscopically, including in flow, this is a picture on, on a rheometer in line, as beautiful, beautiful colors. So then the idea was if we try to, to uh, combine this, uh, uh, the, this type of uh, uh, suspensions with a Tillerquet flow in an independently rotating cylinder system, uh, what would we get? I also have to say that um, this might sound very abstract, but I will say it for the, uh, those of you who are uh, really connoisseurs on this. The mechanism for elasticity uh, between a suspension like this and a polymer solution should be a little bit different. So we thought, okay, we even without the synchrotron, we have a unique experiment. And if we go to the experiment uh, uh, to the synchrotron, let's see, let's see what we will get. And here is what we are doing. So a new experiment. We have cellulose on our crystals. So notice the coloring. We don't have have any other additives. So there's always a question: if you have a non-Newtonian fluid, you add visualization particles, and at some point, they will disrupt some some structure in there, or at least you might suspect they they disrupt or the suspicion that this one might, that might exist here. We don't have any, any additives to make the visualizations. And we have a, uh, a more, let's say, special case of elasticity, as well as a system with independently rotating uh, inner and outer cylinders. Yeah? So we can uh, rotate them independently. And here we have three cases. And by the way, for the first time, I've never seen this in a, in a presentation. I took this from a movie we made for a submission. We're going to listen also to some music. I, I, if you will see, hear it, I hope I selected the parameters right. Nevertheless, here um, uh, you have the inner cylinder rotating. Here you have the outer cylinder rotating, and this would be a counter rotation. Without further ado, they're spinning very fast because this video has been sped up 20 times. And you see at the critical parameter uh, the uh, inner cylinder rotating has started to, to make funny things. The, uh, the other two are still laminar, but not for long, as you can, uh, you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> if you, if you uh, are, are, want to follow the rotation, it's easier to look at something to the free surface there. It can, uh, it can show the, how, how fast basically it's rotating. And here you have uh, also the counter rotating case, which starts to make, you see the patterns are different. And these patterns, especially in counter rotating are a little bit more, more, more difficult to access. There are a number of studies on, on uh, non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, they are far less. And also we have this, this idea that we have uh, cellulose nanocrystals in, in this case. Right, this was fun to make, and I hope you could hear the music actually. Um, all right, so a little bit of analysis. Uh, what are we doing? Um, so we're trying to identify specific states in this, this experiment. So you've seen all these letters, uh, DVF, VVF, and so on. 
And we were identifying them based on, and I'm leading to the SACS experiment, based on spectrum analysis. So if you have a, a wavy regime here, it's called wavy vortex flow. And you convert this, this, uh, this video into a, a space time diagram where you have in this image uh, time essentially, and the vertical axis is the, the Z axis of the cylinders. And this distance L here is the, dis the, the height of the flow column. And it's like this time I don't have a roll, uh, uh, paper roll, but it's like you would unravel a paper roll. Yeah, You're, and on on the axis of the paper roll we have, uh, we have time. And essentially, by taking a certain uh, window here uh, um, on on uh, let's say uh, a moving window, so we sweep this, uh, this this these long images, very long images, and we perform two D Fourier transform analysis. Uh, we can try to separate between patterns that occur in time and patterns that occur in space. Uh, basically, we might have some time periodicities as well as space periodicities, and this may sound a little bit uh, uh, strange, but let's look at an example. This is a typical uh, test where we vary the Reynolds number as function of time on a given ramp. So our the speed of, in this case, inner cylinder is increasing linearly. Uh, and as you see on the space-time image, at some critical parameter you have, we, we have, this is a little bit shifted here. Uh, it's Taylor vortex flow and then wavy vortex flow and then modulated vortex flow and so on. And how do we know that? Well, if we look at spectrograms of, of time periodicities and sp spectrograms of, of, uh, of space periodicities, we get, we basically get this. So when Taylor vortices occur, so you have these bands, there's no, no uh, uh, characteristic frequency in time because they are all steady bands, but they do have a periodicity. If you take this image, tilt it and you look at it, mm, okay, it's periodic in space. So that's what we read here as the critical wave number for the onset of Taylor vortex flow. And when you have wavy vortices, then we have a, a periodicity in space here, they are, they are modulated uh, and we get here a characteristic, characteristic frequency in time of that pattern. So based on spectral analysis, we simply categorize, uh, uh, this is a manuscript in progress, the different uh, instability modes that we get. And of course we make an interpretation for the SAC experiment and meant this was the raw data where we selected uh, several, we tried to reach several types of specific patterns to try to see how, how uh, what we can see with on, on, a, on the beam line. So here was uh, our geometry at the beam line, uh, uh, just mounted there. If you're wondering what that red is, it looks just very cool, but it's just a laser with which we try to align things um, to see where, where we're shooting. Uh, so we have a twin drive set, set up here uh, with independent, so the, the two engines uh, rotate independently, which is a non-standard setup uh, for, for this type of experiments. And uh, I was mentioning here, especially anisotropy is important and azimuthal integration because this is how we're going to discuss most of our results right now. Uh, we've we, we're trying to capture phenomena that is both periodic in space and periodic in time, so that is quite a bit of a challenge. So we are, are sweeping every 0.5 millimeters, uh, uh, several locations, uh, both tangentially, remember this letter B here, uh, it corresponds to this letter B here, uh, and also radially letter A is over here. So we, we probe this every 0.5 millimeters. I don't remember how much or how long. Um, and on each point, we of course record a certain amount of time. And to get a better signal, we also had to average this thing uh, several in several ways. Um, and this is particularly uh, important for non-axisymmetric patterns, which means you have uh, both time and space periodicities. For axisymmetric patterns, it's a little bit easier because we we can just probe, uh, we don't need necessarily to see time dependence, we can just probe uh, uh, vertically, scan vertically the vortices and see how the, how the structure looks like. I should mention here that uh, um, previously there has been a paper uh, identifying these vortices. Um, uh, we're trying to take it to twin drive, especially to uh, controtating, which is a more peculiar case. And also we're interested in, from a cellulose and a crystal's point of view, we're interested in what, does uh, weak turbulence do to these uh, um, crystalline structures? That should be a very, very interesting question, research questions, if we can actually capture that. 
So here we have a laminar coet flow. So what you would have on a standard rheometer. Uh, this time though, we have anisotropic particles in it. Uh, given that it's flow, we can consider them as, as pneumatic. Uh, as pneumatic phase. And you can imagine if we look from the uh, A perspective here, then they would be oriented in the flow direction like this. And because they travel on, on a circle, uh, we look from the B perspective, they would be oriented like this, just like, as, uh, just like you have it in, in these examples over here. So essentially through azimuthal integration, we see uh, essentially exactly what we were talking about. Uh, we have a spatial scan here. Um, and we see that in A, so this is this is corresponds to A, this corresponds to B. Let me change colors to green. So A here and B over here. And we see this this uh, immediately how, how this uh, uh, angle angle changes, which means we were looking at a, an anisotropic structure. Uh, I'll give me a moment, my uh, connection has crashed. We're looking at an anisotropic structure of this form. Uh, basically, we have a very nice anisotropy and everything is nicely oriented. Uh, what do we see on the spectrograms? Pretty much nothing, proving that it's laminar coet flow. These lines over here correspond exactly to the rotation of the inner cylinder. It's impossible to eliminate completely any wobbling and their harmonics, high harmonics. Now we're going towards a wavy vortex flow. Uh, where we're starting to see something a little bit more different. I will skip trying to say how we identified this spectrally. It's enough to look at the space-time diagram and you see a, a periodic pattern both in time and space. And if we look at the, the uh, um, uh, uh, temporal uh, spatial scan, pardon me, uh, uh, then we see again that we have some sort of change in orientation. But if we look at the temporal scan, we also start to see, if you look very closely, that uh, there is some time dependence there. So that's the first indication that we capture some of the time dependence uh, that is associated to these, these vortices. Um, modulated, vortex, uh, modulated vortex flow. This is a, a, um, a type of flow which has a time periodicity, two time periodicities. So it's uh, something like this. Uh, and we see even even more differences, uh, even in the spatial scan, uh, as well as the, the the temporal scan a little bit. Uh, most interestingly, I would jump to, uh, this would be turbulent vortex flow. So this is um, high Reynolds number flow. Uh, and this time you could clearly see in the temporal, the spatial scan, sorry, uh, A, B, we actually did two types of Bs, mid gap and uh, mid and outer range, outer edge, sorry. So it's, it's either you're here in the middle gap or you're really close to the, the edge. These are more complex, both time and, and space structures. And uh, we do see quite, quite some, some difference in these uh, spatial scans, uh, uh, but uh, a little bit less in their uh, the temporal behavior likely because they might be a little bit too fast. It's, it's a matter of, but clearly this, this, this looks uh, fairly well. And uh, counter rotation, uh, this is just an example of, of this, uh, what we're, this is the, the newest part, let's say. Um, so in this case, the inner cylinder is rotating in one direction, the outer one is in another direction. And, but we're still in the laminar quad flow, laminar quad flow. What does this mean? Uh, you can imagine here in this detail, where I point right now in the purple magenta, magenta, I guess. Uh, if this is rotating in, in the, to, the, to the right and this is rotating to the left, then we will have a, a zero velocity plane in there. So you could, and there will be a small difference in, could be a small difference in Reynolds numbers as well. So you might get one type of instability at the, the outer edge and another one in the inner edge, at least that's, that's the idea. Um, and they will be traveling opposite. So there's always some, likely some interference between the two. But just to verify that we're getting laminar coet flow, Essentially, we have this type of structure, simple orientation in the flow direction, um, and we're getting pretty much what we discussed. There's nothing special. And we get that both uh, um, mid gap and outer range. So we get pretty much the same structures uh, everywhere. If we take a uh, wavy vortex flow, wavy vortex flow though, uh, uh, we see uh, again, uh, we have we have orientation, but we also have uh, spatial uh, uh, difference in space. 
uh, and also depends a little bit where we're looking at differences in time, uh, a little bit less than we had expected. And we suspect that is also because uh, uh, um, uh, we have this type of, of, uh, of uh, distortion in the patterns, which to us meant that uh, this might look a little bit more turbulent than it actually is. So there's always a component of, of let's put it this way, there's always a component of trying to figure out uh, um, what exactly you're looking at, even from an experimental point of view, because there might be small, small differences between them. All right. I've talked, uh, by the way, this is a favorite subject of mine. It has been also my PhD thesis, flow stability and pattern formation. So I tend to talk a lot and maybe very detailed. Bottom line, we have a unique experiment uh, that we're trying to replicate with a synchrotron. Uh, and uh, well, we're going to, we're going to, more results will be coming soon, as well as other two surprises that I mentioned. With that, I'm heading towards the end. Um, a little bit of advertisement. If uh, what you saw was interesting and you want to learn more about rheology, you should know that within tree search, there is a, uh, a PhD course called Introduction into Rheology, which includes also uh, rheology combined with synchrotron experiments. Um, it's held every two years since we held it this year uh, in April. I'm afraid uh, if you're really interested, you'll have to wait until 2024, around April, that would be the goal. But on the other side, if you are really uh, um, ready with your experiments and you've been at a synchrotron and uh, everything is fine, you're cordially invited to join us at the Nordic Rheology Conference held to be held in Aarhus in Denmark in, um, in the, big, in the mid, uh, around mid-April. And with that, I have my last slide. Uh, what does it take to do a synchrotron experiment? Uh, uh, and I've shown you just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, well, it takes a lot of people and a great team here. Uh, with uh, Silvia from my group, Amit from my group, Reza, who I, I mentioned, but you haven't seen him, uh, and Terry, Kim Nigord, Natalie, who, who was an intern helping us, uh, uh, Esan from Stockholm University, uh, also helping us, and from uh, Jackson and uh, Paolo, Pablo from, from the local team. And with that, I also thank you very, very much for your uh, attention. Dear Roland, thank you so much. Very nice presentation. Amazing results. Congratulations for this great attempt and the data already being obtained. Fantastic. Good luck also with Slowly. the further publication. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the audience, does uh, anyone have any questions? If you have any questions, please um, post them in the chat, Q&A, raise your hand to take this opportunity to talk to Roland and um, in the meantime, Roland, I would like to also thank you for letting everyone know that you have the courses and encouraging people to sign up. Yes, please do so. Also, for the upcoming courses, keep your eyes open and check that research website. So we are developing the schedule for the courses for the next year. So, um, And uh, also, in the meantime, I want to encourage all of you to check our YouTube channel because we have the great presentations by Kim and Sam about uh, four marks in general so you know like what is the beam line how to apply how to plan your experiments uh, so check it out and besides that also you can uh, see some other videos from the tree search uh, like for instance the infrastructure the different nodes and many other activities i can see one hand up from uh, mahmoudul so i'm thinking maybe mahmoudul i can ask you to unmute yeah, you. So you can ask the question directly. Hey. Yes. Hey. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. I'm the uh, student of uh, KTH and doing my nanotechnology master's here. So I would like to uh, know, is there any internship or any kind of such opportunities available for you or not? Um, you have to ask, um, I, I don't know if you refer necessarily to, uh, to, to what we, I guess it's this cooperation with Max4 and then you have to ask and maybe Max4 or ourselves can have this opportunity within this cooperation. It's, uh, you have to ask in the, with a delay, I'm sure, <laughs> expect that. Uh, we, we have to see, it depends on the circumstances and so on, but it's, it's great to see such, I would say, early insight into such work. Uh, that's really fabulous to see that we are here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, that's actually a great question because what we will be uh, probably trying to do, we will try to organize maybe some events which are targeted towards, you know, like early career specialists and uh, it's it's work in progress. We will see. So yes. keep your eyes open. So probably through the research, there will be an initiative for them. Um, well, internship also performed. Uh, we don't promise yet, but that's something yeah. that we started <laughs> to discuss for the next year. So we will Fantastic. be investigating it. Yes, good. Are there any more questions? Uh, I would like to ask a question also to yes. Roland. So for instance, if researchers would like to perform the similar studies like you yeah. did, um, would it be better if they talk directly to you or if they start with discussing with Kim and Sam? Yes, it will make no difference. Just contact any of us and uh, we'll get together. Uh, our real intention is to, uh, to in, in this collaboration, we really intend to make the special step. So if you have standard measurements, that's fine. But if you are really aiming for something, we would be very curious to hear about it. Uh, something special would be very curious to hear about it. So you just have to, to say it and we'll try to see what we can do. This is great. This is great because, you know, in general, launching of the... Max 4 and 4 Max and all the possibilities for the beam line, that was a big thing. So for those of you who don't know, last week there were some also experiments done by the team from KTH and uh, check out our LinkedIn. There are some posts there also about it. Uh, and uh, I think in general doing the in to studies, that's also like a know-how. So when you can do the dynamic in situ analysis, you combine it with the rheology. I know that some of my colleagues, they combine it with mechanical testing or with the yeah. reactors. So that's uh, truly fascinating. Yeah. That's really and great. Very good that you mentioned Formax because we're going to be commissioning the rheometer also for Formax. So keep an eye on that because uh, there, are, there are new possibilities from the beamline and we're, uh, uh -huh. we might be stepping into some new areas as well. Uh, uh, let's see how, how that will go. Wow, this is great. Good luck with it. <laughs> yes, we yes. need it. Thank you. This is really nice. Uh, I see that people thank you also in the chat for the great presentation. We had quite a few followers. Uh, I also want to let you know that all of you who are following today, we will save the recording and we will post it on our YouTube channel. So in the case, if you have any colleagues or... Yeah, you know, someone who wants to see the webinar or you want to revisit it once again, just go to our YouTube channel. This webinar will be available maybe like in a week or two. We just need to edit it a little bit. And um, probably we will discuss it also with Kim and Sam, but we will probably keep this tradition of, you know, like feedback sessions and helping you with sending in the applications to the four marks. Uh, so um, also keep your eyes open. Most probably uh, some more events like this will come the next year also. Maybe Roland will be back also to present some more novelties and discoveries. Yes, looking forward to that. <laughs> and I want to encourage all of you to attend the conference that Roland was talking about because it's an amazing conference. I know some colleagues who participated in it, so everyone was uh, very happy yes some more thank you thank you so much uh, Annika and Loren, uh, Loredana for the great words um, for the thank you to Roland uh, if you have any questions please feel free to email Roland email also thank infrastructure you. at research and talk to Kim and Sam talk to me and Christine if you have anything in mind probably with this yeah. we can yeah round up for today some more thank you in the chat thank you riasa yes thank you roland thank you so much once again <laughs> thank you Riza, as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> and thank you christine for the organization of the webinar also